Hello, AP students. I've had a number of students that either struggled on the quiz with a few questions or have just asked me a lot about certain questions prior to or since the quiz. And so I want to go through some of those problems and explain how you would solve them, giving you some examples from positive physics. So if you've had some trouble or had some confusion, follow along in these explanations. So the first one I'd like to discuss is this question where we have a system of two pulleys and two masses. It says the system shown is released from rest. After release, the seven kilogram block moves upward with an acceleration of three meters per second squared. Neglect drag friction and the mass of the string and the pulley. Create an equation in terms of M then solve. What is the tension in the string? What is the unknown mass? So over here, what I would do is start drawing what I know around the diagram. I know that this seven kilogram object is accelerating upward according to the directions at three meters per second squared. And so if I draw its free body diagram, I'm looking here on the right when my red font, uh, it's going to have a large arrow tension force going up and a small weight force going down. We know the tension has to be larger because it's accelerating upward and the tension force is the upward force. We know the weight would be 70 newtons. We're using 10 for the value of G. And so we take seven kilograms times 10 to get a weight of 70 newtons. So the tension force must be something larger than 70. Now we've been given quite a bit of information about this. So continuing to follow along in the red font, I'd see that the F net is MA, that's just Newton's second law. And that would also be seven times three, the seven kilograms times the three meters per second squared for a net force of 21 newtons. But another way to, defi to define or calculate net force is by the sum of the forces. This is just Newton's second law, but the sum of the forces is also the net force. And we're talking about a vector sum. So in this case, if I have a vector sum of the tension and the weight force, I would be taking the tension minus the weight because the tension is upward and the weight is downward. You could also think about it as the tension being larger and the weight being smaller. And so if I subtract the weight, which is 70 from the tension, I should get this 21 Newton net force that we calculated using Newton's second law. So if I solve for FT, I can find out the tension force is 91 Newtons. And that makes sense. We said it should be larger than 70 so that it would accelerate upward. Now this 91 Newtons is the tension in the whole cable, not just this side. And the acceleration of three meters per second squared is the acceleration of this whole system, just in different directions on either side. But the value would be the same. So now if I start to look at this unknown mass over here, if the right side of the system is accelerating upward, this side must be accelerating downward. And if the tension in the rope is 91 Newtons over here, it's gotta be 91 Newtons on this side. Since on the left side in blue now, it is accelerating downward, I know that the weight force must be larger than the tension since the weight force is the downward force. And I know I can calculate weight by taking mass times G. So I'm gonna go through the same process of using Newton's second law and the sum of forces to have two different ways to determine the net force. So Newton's second law tells me mass times acceleration. I don't know the mass of this second block, but I do know its acceleration is three. So its net force would be 3m. I also know that it would be weight minus tension force because the weight is larger and the tension force is smaller since it's accelerating downward in the direction of the weight. So weight is mg and the tension force we calculated before is 91. So I know the net force is also mg minus 91. And so I, I can write that as m times 10, the acceleration due to gravity here, rounded to 10, minus 91. Now I've got two equations for net force. I put a little purple mark beside each one. They're both equal to net force for this same object, so I can set them equal to each other. So this 3m from the first Newton's second law uh, problem, part of the problem is equal to the 10m minus 91 from the second part of the problem where we're an analyzing this block and its net force two different ways. Then I just solve for m and find out that the mass on this side would be 13 kilograms. Now this should be bigger than the seven kilogram one because it's causing the seven kilogram block to rise while it falls. So it is logical that this one would be less mass than the other one. All right, so that is how we can solve for um, the values on this equation. All right, the next scenario that I had a lot of questions about is this one. A system is at rest as shown. So if it's at rest, there's no net force, no acceleration, everything's balanced. String one has a mass of 0.2 kilograms and string two has a mass of 0.5 kilograms and the mass of the other objects are shown. 
So I've, I've just labeled it on the picture. String one would be two newtons, 0.2 kilograms times 10. This three kilogram mass would be 30 newtons, three times 10. This second string is 0.5 kilograms. So 0.5 times 10 is five newtons. And this bottom block would be 80 newtons following the same pattern. To figure out the tension at each point, I just need to add up whatever forces of weight there are pulling down from that point. So at point A, all of them are below that point. So the two plus the 30 plus the five and the 80 all would be creating tension at that point. At point B, it's all, it doesn't include the first string because the first string's above it. At point B, it would just be this three kilogram mass, the middle string and the bottom one. So 30 plus five plus 80. At point C, it's just the string below it and the bottom block, so five plus 80. And at point D, it's just the bottom block or 80 Newtons. This question says a 5,000 kilogram locomotive is pulling 4,000 kilogram cars to the right. The locomotive is experiencing 1,200 Newtons of drag and the cars each experience 100 Newtons of drag. How much force does the locomotive need to generate to pull the given number of cars with constant speed? The number of cars does not include the locomotive. So constant speed tells me again, forces are balanced. There is no net force, therefore no acceleration. If there's no acceleration and no net force, um, the power or the pulling force that the train has to provide just needs to balance out with the drag. So if I think about it um, in a picture, the locomotive has 1200 Newtons of drag and then each car is 100 apiece. So if there are 10 cars, I would take 10 times 100 to get the drag for all 10 cars and then add it to the 1200. In this example down below, I'm doing the bottom problem, 50 cars. So 50 cars times 100 Newtons of drag each plus the 1200 Newtons for the locomotive gives me a total of 6,200 Newtons. So you would just do that same process, multiplying the number of cars times the drag per car, adding it to the drag of the locomotive. For this question, it says, analyze the free body diagram given the coefficients of static and kinetic friction. Determine whether the block will slide and the net force on the system. So I've got some colors here. We're gonna start with red, so you can follow along with red. First off, I looked at this block on the table and I know that this block has a weight of 40 Newtons. We can see it's labeled in the diagram. If its weight is 40 Newtons and this table is flat, the normal force is also 40 Newtons. So I've just written it up here. That's the normal force. Over here, we can see the weight of this block is 23 Newtons. And over here, we know that this, according to the table, says it has a weight of 10 Newtons. So I've just written in red. Again, we're just focusing on the red values for now. So if this is pulling with 10 Newtons of force and this is pulling with 23, let's just for a second imagine that this block up here isn't there. If that block wasn't there, then this whole system would rotate towards the 23 Newton side. The 10 Newton block on the left would rise, the 23 Newton block would fall. However, this block on the table is there, so we have to consider what impact it will have. And it says there's friction. So there's going to be friction from this block resisting. Now, based on the numbers they've given us, 10 for the left, 10 uh, Newtons of weight on the left and 23 on the right, it's going to naturally want to flow to the right, okay, kind of moving clockwise around these pulleys. But the, so the friction will resist that motion. Friction resists motion for most scenarios. And I mean, it does technically in all scenarios, but sometimes it's confusing. So uh, it's gonna resist the motion. And we can figure out the static friction. The coefficient of friction is 0.2. And the formula for friction right here is coefficient of friction times normal force. So they've given us the coefficient of 0.2. We know the normal force is 40. So 0.2 times 40 is eight Newtons. So our static friction force is eight. So the question is, between this eight Newtons of friction and this 10 Newtons of weight on the left, is that enough to keep this 23 Newton weight on this side from pulling it down? So here down below the picture in red again, I've said, well, we've got 10 Newtons of force pulling this way because of the weight. We've got eight new Newtons of force resisting the movement because of the friction. That is 18 Newtons. That is not as much as the 23 Newtons that's pulling down on this right side. Therefore, this will still move even though there is friction. Now, because it's going to move, static friction is the breaking point. It helps us know whether the object will move or not. Kinetic friction is the friction when something is in motion. So since we know it will move because this 23 is larger than the weight and the friction added together, 
it will move. So the friction will actually be kinetic friction. And for kinetic friction, we use the kinetic coefficient, which is given up here as 0.15. We still multiply it by the normal force, but 0.15 times 40 Newton normal force is six Newtons. So the actual fight of forces will be the 10 Newton weight pulling plus six Newtons of kinetic force uh, resisting. So there's only going to be 16 Newtons of force resisting this 23 Newtons trying to pull it down. So the net force would be seven. So will it slide? Yes. The weight on the right is more than the sum of the friction and the weight on the left. What is the friction force? Well, since it will move, it'll be the kinetic friction force, which is six. What direction is the friction? It's going to oppose the way this would naturally move. And then the net force, as we've said, is seven Newtons. Now we're gonna look at the green font scenario. If the weight on the left is 20 Newtons, so over here I've labeled it 20 Newtons. Well, now if we think about the scenario, we've got 20 Newtons on the left pulling it, and we've got eight Newtons of static friction force. So that is greater than the 23 Newtons pulling it this way, all right? So it's greater than the 23. So the, the friction and the weight on the other side will not go. Now, let's pause just for a second. Remember this eight Newtons is not actually pulling it, it's resisting the motion. So if we just think about the 20 and the 23, if there was no friction up here, if this block wasn't there, this would flow to the right again, just like the previous example. Even though this is 20 now, it's still less than 23. So if there was no friction, it would flow clockwise, right? Not in a circle, but the right side would flow down, the left side would flow up, and the, the string across the top would go to the right. However, there is friction. So when we add the static friction with the weight that's resisting that 23 Newtons, there is more weight and more friction than there is pulling down. So this will not move. If this will not move, so up here we say, no, this will not slide. Okay, well, if it won't slide, then that means no movement, no acceleration, and so no net force. The forces have to be balanced. Well, over here, we got 23 Newtons pulling. So 20 pulling on this side, what amount of friction is there to balance it out? Well, if you got 20 Newtons pulling it on the left and you got 23 pulling it on the right, the friction must be supplying three to balance it out. So the friction force is three and the net is zero. Since it won't move, the net has to be zero. All right. The next one, we're gonna move on to the blue scenario where we've got 30 weight on the left. So this time we have 30 on the left over here and only 23 on the right. So this time, if there was no block at the top on the table, it would go the other direction. It would go kind of in the counterclockwise motion the 23 Newton object on the right would rise, the 30 Newton object on the left would fall, right? So it's gonna go that way. So now we have to think about it a little bit different. So over here in the blue font, I can see that the 30 Newton is the driving force. That's what's gonna drive it to try to pull it to the left. The friction force is still eight Newtons because it's still the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And the opposite side has that 23 Newtons of weight well, when I add the 23 Newtons of weight plus the friction, that's 31. That is greater than the 30 Newton pulling force on the left. So again, this will not move. Since it will not move, there's no acceleration. Since there's no acceleration, there's no net force. So we can put a zero here, no net force. It would try to move this block on the table to its left. Therefore, friction is resisting that movement and would be directed in the opposite to the right. The friction force is gonna be whatever it takes to balance it out. So there's 30 Newtons of pulling force. There's 23 Newtons of weight resisting that. And then the amount of friction that's required to balance it out and create a zero net force would be seven Newtons. So if it doesn't move, you're trying to figure out how much friction is there to balance it. Because remember, static friction is a maximum. Static friction will only provide as much force as, as is necessary to keep it still. It won't be its maximum. So it can resist up to eight Newtons of force. That doesn't mean it's going to give eight Newtons of force. In this case, it's only gonna give seven Newtons of force. It's capable of resisting up to eight, but it only needs to give seven to keep this stationary. So I hope that helps you understand the concepts behind this one. Um, you have to think about what static friction means, what kinetic friction means, what the difference is between when it moves and when it won't. All right, let's go on to this next one. 
In this scenario, it says the student wants to determine the range of masses that can be hung to keep a block at rest on a table as shown. Coefficient of static friction between the 29 kilogram block and the surface is 0.33. The coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.23. So first they say, what is the smallest mass that keeps the system at rest? And basically what they're saying is, if the left side, this M box on the left is smaller, it's going to want to raise and the 15 kilogram is going to want to fall. And this block on the table is gonna to wanna to slide to the right. And they're saying, if you factor in the friction force and the weight of this block on the left, what would the weight of the block on the left have to be to perfectly balance that 15 kilogram block on the right? So on my picture here, now I'm starting with blue font this time around. I know this is a 29 kilogram block on top of the table times an acceleration due to gravity of 10 gives me 200 Newton normal force. Over here on the right, this 15 kilogram block would be a 150 Newton weight force. The friction, static friction, because we're trying to see what would keep it from moving. We want to keep it at rest. The static friction maximum value would be the coefficient of friction times normal force. The coefficient was given 0.33. We determined the normal force based on the weight since it's a flat table. And we can see if we multiply those, the maximum static friction is 95.7. So the most this friction can resist this block is 95.7. This block is 150. So that friction is not enough to keep the block from pulling it. This block over here needs to account for the difference, right? So it's got 150 pulling. Friction's resisting with 95.7, but that's still almost 55 newtons of force lacking, right? So if we think about the net force, it needs to be balanced. The net force needs to be zero to be at rest. So we got 150 newton pulling force because of this block hanging. We got a maximum of 95.7 newtons of friction available from this block on the table. So if we subtract those, the weight over here that would balance everything out to zero would be 54.3 Newtons. The question though says, what is the smallest mass? So to convert that 54.3 Newtons of weight, we have to divide by acceleration due to gravity or divide by 10. So the mass in kilograms would be 5.43. So if we think about our answers here, the smallest mass would be a 5.43 kilogram block that little bit of weight added to the friction would be able to balance out this 15 kilogram block on the other side. The friction can only provide 95.7 Newtons of force maximum, and its direction in this scenario would be to the left. It would be resisting um, this 15 kilogram block driving the movement. The second part says, what is the largest mass that can keep the system at rest? So what they're saying now is, what if this block over here on the left was actually bigger than the 15? and it was pulling it the other direction. How big could it be and still have everything balanced out? So we know that the friction's not gonna change because the friction is all based on this block that's sitting on the table and it's still 29 kilograms, therefore still has a normal force of 290. Therefore its friction force is still 95.7. But if we're maxing out this block on the left, it's gonna try to pull the block on the table to the left, which means friction would be opposite that and back to the right. To determine the mass, we need to think through just like we did before. The mass of this block hanging over here has to be balanced out by the friction force and the 150 Newtons that's hanging over here. Well, we know the friction force is 95.7. So if we add that to the 150 Newtons, this weight over here, the most it could possibly be is 245.7 Newtons. If it was any larger than that, the friction and the 150 Newton weight on the right side of the table would not be enough to stop it. But if it's exactly 245.7 Newtons, then that's all balanced out. The friction plus the weight on the other side gets balanced by this value. Now the question again says the largest mass, not the largest weight. And mass is in kilograms, weight is in Newtons. Weight is a force, mass is a property of the matter. So we take this 245.7 Newtons divided by 10 for the acceleration due to gravity, and we get a 24.6 kilogram mass that would be the largest value over here to keep it from sliding the other direction. All right, that is all for the systems. A lot of questions about those came up. Now let's talk about the electric force. There are a few questions about electric force as well. Two atoms experience an electric force as shown approximate the atoms as point charges. 
what direction is the force on the left atom? What direction is the force on the right atom? So if we look at these, we've got electrons and electrons. So if you know chemistry, you know that they're negative and negatives and negatives are gonna repel because like charges repel. If you don't know chemistry and you don't know that they're negative, you should still be able to determine that they'll repel because electrons and electrons are the same. So whatever charge they have, they would be the same. And if they're the same, there will be a repulsion, which means these are gonna push apart. This one's gonna be pushed by a force to its left and move to the left. This one's gonna be pushed by a force to its right and move to the right. Then if we look at our list over here of variables that we have to identify and fill in for, the K value is just a constant. And I've added this equation up here in the middle. This comes from the AP formula list. Um, so this is where all those variables come from. The K is a constant. Q1 is the charge of the first object. Q2 is the charge of the second object. R squared is the difference between or the distance between objects one and two. So we don't know the force. We're gonna have to calculate that. But the K value, we just look up this number here. We're just gonna look up on the AP formula list. The Q left and Q right, we're gonna to have to determine from what's given. So also on the AP formula list, you can see this number up on the right here, that is the charge of an electron. It is actually right above the K value on that list. They're literally right next to each other on that handout. So every electron has this much charge. Well, this has nine extra electrons. So its charge will be nine times that. So this Q left will be nine times that number. For Q right, it says there's four extra electrons. So I need to multiply four by this charge per electron. That will be four times that number will be the value of charge on the right. And then the R value is just given here in the picture right here. All right, once we know all those values, we plug them in and we can solve for force. So the key is recognizing that the charge of an electron is given on the AP formula sheet as is the constant K. So once you know those two values, you can plug those things in and solve the problem from there. The next electricity or electric force question that had some people asking for help was this one. A pith ball experiences an electric force of 0 0.0882 newtons to the right caused by a charge rod, charged rod. Approximate the, the objects as point charges. So again, I wrote down the formula, which you can get from the AP chart. And you can see that this pith ball that's hanging by this string it's not being attracted to this rod, it's being pushed away. Therefore, there's a repelling force. If it's a repelling force, these charges have to be the same value, not the same number, but the same charge, positive or negative. So the rod is, point, or is positive 4.55 times 10 to the negative seven coulombs. So we don't know the value for the pith ball, but we know it has to be positive because the two positives would repel and that's why this would be pushed to its right and make that string stretch that way. If I come over here to my list of, of uh, variables to identify, the force was given up here in the problem, 0 0.0882. K, we look up on the AP formula sheet. Q of the rod, given in the picture. R, given in the picture. So all we have to solve for is Q of the pith. And the, the charge of this pith ball, we can find solving for Q2. It doesn't really matter whether you call it Q1 or Q2, um, but I just called it Q2. So it's gonna be the force times radius squared divided by K times the charge of the rod. I plug these numbers in and find the charge of the pith ball. All right, and the last electric force question that I had people asking about, a student is trying to lift a 0 0.0663 kilogram pith ball off the ground as shown. Determine all unknowns the instant the pith ball begins to lift off the ground as the electric force matches the gravitational force. Approximate objects as point charges. Again, here's our equation from the AP formula list. And here we see the rod has a positive charge. The pith ball has a negative charge. Therefore, they are opposite in their charge and they will attract each other. All right, so what they're basically saying here, let me grab a couple of magnets real quick and show you. You've probably seen something like this before. I've got a magnet in my hand and then I've got another magnet in my other hand. There's an attraction between them and if I get them close enough, one magnet's gonna jump off my hand and snap up and connect it. That's what they're saying is happening here. They're trying to get them close enough that the charge of one will overcome the weight of the other. Like it says in the, in the problem, we're trying to find when that electric force matches the gravitational force. Now, hopefully you could see that. I don't know if that 
shows the video of me or not, but hopefully you could, if you couldn't see it, hopefully you can picture it. Uh, if you've ever held a magnet above another one, you don't have to get them to touch for them to attract. They just have to get close enough. So what's happening here is the weight of that pith ball is what the electric force is trying to match. So the force is just the weight of the pith ball. It says in the problem, its mass is 0 0.0663 kilograms. So I just multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity. Now I did not write 10 meters per second squared here. I put Newtons per kilogram because that is also an acceptable variable or unit for acceleration due to gravity. Now I can't remember on the positive physics whether they used meters per second squared or Newtons per kilogram, or maybe they had both there. I don't, I don't recall, but I did want you to see this because this Newtons per kilogram value is going to become more and more frequently shown in problems we look at. It is the same as meters per second squared. All right, K value, we look up on the AP formula list, Q of the rod given in the picture, Q of the pith ball given in the picture. We just need to solve for that distance when the electric force of attraction will pull the mass, the weight of that pith ball up off the table. So we just solve for R, which would be the square root of K times Q1 times Q2 divided by that electric force which in this case would match the math, the weight force. All right, so that is how you work out those problems. I hope that has been helpful. Um, those were the most commonly asked questions. Some students only had questions on one, some students had questions on multiple, but I wanted to just run through a variety of them. If you struggled on that quiz and you still aren't sure how to solve some of those problems, I wanted to help uh, you learn how to do that. And if you did struggle, I would suggest go back to positive physics and practice them, figure out how you can get them uh, solved correctly. And so that you'll know, you know how to solve these kind of problems for any upcoming exam or test that we might take in class or the actual AP exam. All right, hope that helps. Thanks for watching.